All right. So with that, um, I'm going to start us off with just a quick presentation on Achievement Day. It is coming up to that time of the year. And I guess I should introduce myself. Um, my name is is Lexi Hoy, and I am a 4-H specialist, uh, specifically with the Calgary region, but I do work on uh, various provincial activities and events as well. So just getting us started, and Barry, can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yeah, everything looks good here. Okay. So this is part three of starting off on the right foot, and I guess I should introduce Barry. Um, Barry has joined us in the previous two webinars to talk about feeding, feeding animals, and he will be rounding up that series uh, tonight in just a few minutes. So we'll get started. Um, so I guess, yeah, as our contents would, weigh, um, would hint at, that's what we're going to get at. Um, just if you have any questions, jot them down and we'll, we'll take them at the end. Or you can type them into the webinar or the question and answer. Raise your hand. We'll be checking all of those throughout, throughout Barry's presentation, at least, because then I can see them. I can't see them at the moment. All right. So I wanted to start us off with, with the 4-H Parent Pledge. This is something that, that we, as, as um, staff, have discovered in the last week, I guess you could say. You'll notice the old logo at the top. Um, but I think it's something that's really important. And if we're going to be talking about Achievement Day or any events, really, that relate to 4-H, and if you were at Leaders Conference, you might have heard about this as well. Um, so it's, I pledge my head to give my child the information I can to help him or her see things clearly and to make wise decisions. Heart to encourage and support my child, no matter whether he or she has successes or disappointments. Hands, to help my club's child. If I cannot be a leader, I can help in many equally important ways. Health, to keep my child strong and well for a better world through 4-H, for my child's club, our community, and our country. So I think that this is really important. And sometimes I, I think we might forget some of this, but, but 4-H is for our members. And I just wanted to put this, um, reminder in here for, for all of the parents that might be on the call or on the webinar. Um, the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to, but maybe ever so subtly, is the parents' anti-pledge. And that's, I pledge my head to force my ideas on others, whether they're welcome or not, heart to meet my need over the needs of others, hands to do the work for my kids so that they will be a positive reflection on me. Um, I can't quite see the last one. Health to self-righteousness because um, living be because I know that it is best for my club, my community, and my country. So I just wanted to, to highlight those that maybe um, for all 4-H events and especially for, for Achievement Day and what is coming up for the next few months. Um, just to the next slide. So tips for a successful Achievement Day. And if those of you who are listening have planned numerous atten um, Achievement Days, then, then good on you. I just wanted to put this on here for, for maybe those who are newer in their 4-H careers, and it always doesn't, it doesn't hurt ever to have a reminder. So um, communication, I think communication is key, and whether that's for your achievement day or for anything really, um, communicate, what do you need to know? What do others need to know and who else needs to know? So when I say that, I mean who else outside of for your clubs that are participating in your achievement day, um, who else needs to know for achievement day? Um, we'll be talking about some of these options on the next slide. Um, the other thing is plan in advance. You cannot start early enough with the planning. You can definitely um, avoid the meme at the bottom of the page if you start early. If you're new or are taking on a new role, ask for assistance. Um, I heard the antidote, I've heard the antidote a few times of it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Uh, please don't subscribe to that theory when planning something. Please do not hesitate to ask for assistance, whether it's a leader who's done it before or somebody you know um, that can help you. Um, and then something to, to do, and I, I'm not sure that we're all the best at doing this, but that's take notes for next year. So as you go through the process and as you go through your achievement day, make sure you take some time to write down your thoughts and take notes for next year. What worked well, what didn't, and, and what what would you do differently next year? So this next slide is basically a six page document that I have summarized on one page. And I will show you where this document is because it is on our 4-H website. So who is your planning committee? 
have you elected your chair, secretary, treasurer, and your show, show slash, a lot of S's in there, show slash sale manager. Um, and what is their contact information? What are your expected numbers? First years, heifers, two-year-old, three-year-old, carcass, and other. Again, that's just so that you know what to expect for, for animals so that you can be prepared. Who will your officials be and who will contact them? So your confirmation, uh, show and ship announcer, et cetera. So like when I say et cetera, things like ringmen, marshals, if you have a stall competition, um, if you do a judging competition, who's going to mark the cards, who is going to keep track of your show results, who's going to take pictures, um, who's going to present the ribbons, that sort of thing. Um, is there any other task that needs a, a committee? Um, do you do some sort of lunch or dinner for, for everybody that's present? Um, who needs to be on that committee? What, who looks after the awards? Um, that sort of thing. Advertising, that's a big one. So who advertises your show? Is it your parents? Is it your members? Ideally, the members would be out um, selling their projects. That is part of what being in this year project is all about is the marketing and advertising aspect of what they have on offer. For all of these, it, it definitely helps to have more than one person, and maybe if you're an inter club, more than one club represented, so that uh, the, the information and learning can be shared by all. All right, so inter club events. Um, what is happening when it set, comes up to Club Achievement Days, are they happening on that day? Do they happen in advance of your inter-club event? What is your show order? Um, the other thing to consider for inter-club events is your species. Do you have just beef? Do you have more species? Is there multiple Achievement Days happening on that day? So how do you all work together? For your awards presentation, where and when is that happening? How is it going to work in the day? Are the awards ordered? That would be up to your award committee. Sale. So what is happening with your sale? Where where will it be? How will it fit in your day? Obviously it will be at the end of the day or may or maybe on a different day. Different people do it different way. Different areas do it different way. Um, what will your sale catalog look like? Um, what are your terms and condition of sale? How do buyers know about your terms and condition of sale? Um, so things like who to check make check able to with the shrink is, trucking arrangement, commission, all of that stuff that comes afterwards. Um, what will happen um, well, when the buyer takes possession of it? What happens for insurance? So just that, that sort of general information. What, what, do, what happens with all of that? And who's responsible for making sure that information is, is announced and, and people know about it? Um, the Cocker Show, if applicable, do you have a judge? Do you have a weigh-in? What, what does that look like in terms of the whole day? Biosecurity. Um, this one is a new one that we don't talk about a lot, but I think it is something that is really important. Whether it's um, beef only, beef is your only species, you still have a number of animals coming from a number of different farms. So there's, there's certain things that need to be considered when, when you're bringing that many um, animals in together. Um, if you have multiple species on site, what does that look like and how do you make sure that you're not transferring um, bacteria or anything else from, from site to site and that doesn't really come into play um, for just multiple species that's for all um, and then post show, show what do you do for thank yous um, and who's responsible for sending them also who's responsible for making sure that any media are notified for any um, announcements of results or anything like that um, I do want to uh, touch on one thing. When I touched on in the previous slide, I talked about who needs to know about your show. Um, and, and I was talking about those outside of 4-H. Um, so obviously when you're talking about getting volunteers or getting things set up, who's going to contact your brand inspector to come and inspect your, your brands on the day of? Um, something that was mentioned in a session at, at Leaders Conference on the weekend that I'm not sure many people think about, but is have you let your local farm supply store know that Achievement Day is coming in and that, you know, it's the third Monday of May. Okay, that's great, but do they know to expect a rush of, of show supplies to walk out the door leading up to that? Um, obviously, you'll be contacting your, your sponsors and your buyers. Um, 
but then let's not forget about those within 4-H. Some of us have been through the Achievement Day spiel and experience, and we know exactly what to expect, we know exactly how to prepare for it, what we need to do a month out, what we need to do three months out, but remember that there are people who are new to 4-H and they might not be able to do that. So to plan for a successful Achievement Day, make sure you're sharing information um, and what to expect with uh, sharing information and making sure people know what to expect and how to prepare for Achievement Day. And then I want to leave you guys with one last question. And that is, why, why do we do Achievement Day? So Achievement Day is one of the five main requirements of being in 4-H. So why do we do Achievement Day? And to sort of answer the question, that is, it's an opportunity for members to show off what they have learned throughout their 4-H year. And it's meant to be a celebration. Um, members can celebrate their successes and what they have learned. And that's really what Achievement Day is all about. So I've just spent quite a few minutes talking about everything that needs to happen to have a successful Achievement Day. But I think that most importantly, a successful Achievement Day is a member who can show off what they have learned, uh, no matter what that might be. And I think if a member can walk away from Achievement Day and say, yep, that went better than last year, or that went, or I learned this for next year, then that is what a uh, successful Achievement Day would look like to them. And with that, um, I am good. So if you have any uh, questions about Achievement Day planning or Achievement Days in general, oh, I know what I was going to do. I was going to show all of you um, where the document is for Achievement Day planning that I had mentioned. So if you just scroll down here and you go into the East Central region under News, scroll down and it should be showing up. Here it is, the Beef Show and Sale Planning Guide. So if you click on that, it will bring up a fillable PDF that is six pages long that will sort of help you through the planning Achievement Day process. So I'm just going to scroll through really quick now um, just so you can get a general idea of what it looks like. Um, but yeah, it basically lays it out for you and provides a place for you to write in a few, or to write in, I guess, names and, and contact information for all that, that are involved in your Achievement Day. So with that, I will officially turn it over to Barry um, for what I'm sure most people are are more excited to hear about, and that is um, basically how to get your animal to the target weight. Um, Barry, if you wanted to go ahead and share your your screen. Um, okay, I will try to do that. <clears throat> Anything coming up? Oh, let me check. Um, just while I'm presenting, that, that screen disappears. So let me just check with the Q&A or anything like that. No, I don't see anything here. Okay. So just... So I can do a brief introduction on Barry if you haven't joined us for a previous webinar. Uh, Barry is a beef and forage specialist with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. I'm sure many of you have had um, the opportunity to attend one of many, Barry's many um, sessions throughout the province. He does put on a few, a few miles <laughs> um, getting around talking about beef nutrition and, and feed for, for beef animals. Um, so yeah. How's it going on your end, Barry? Just about there. Okay. Perfect. Anything from your side? Nope. I'm I'm looking at a gray screen. Anything there? Nope. Good grief. Okay, I sent you the presentation. Okay. Well, so if you can bring it up from your end, that would be just fine too. Perfect. <clears throat> when did you send it to me? When? About yeah. uh, 20 minutes ago. Okay, perfect. That makes me feel better. <laughs> Always be ready for plan B. Exactly. I just hadn't seen it before. But yep. So it's just loading now, and I will um, share my screen. And Barry, when you want to go to the next screen, just tell me next. Okay. We'll, we'll do things that way. 
All right, you should be seeing yep. my screen perfect, and I will just get that going. Um, oops, slideshow, here we go. There we go. And one more quick little swap, and we should be good. All right. All right, great. Thank you very much. It's nice to have people uh, joining us this evening. I appreciate the effort on your part to spend some of the evening with us. But one of the things that I always get questions about is when they, people get to the show and sale, they find out that a percentage of the calves are not quite finished as well as they should be. So what can we do to change the feeding program and recognize where we're at now compared to uh, waiting for another month or month and a half and then there's real problems? Next slide. Um, okay, let me just try this again. There we go. All right. So in the first two seminars we put on, we talked about the starting phase and the transition. But today we're talking about the finishing phase, the one that's most critical. You need a minimum of 110, any place from 100 to 110 days on a finishing ration for that carcass to be marbled properly, to have enough fat, and to be a good animal for slaughter. If they don't have enough finish on them, the meat will be a little bit tougher. It won't be quite as juicy or quite as uh, marbled with the internal fat. And therefore, you're going to have a few more problems with uh, getting a repeat buyer for, for the animals in the, in the next years. Next. So what we're going to cover tonight is use the exit for... for People that are doing the project books right now, you should have some information on uh, about page 10 showing how much weight, where you started off with the weight of these animals, how much they've gained to now, and how does that compare to the, the projected weights that you need on this animal. If you don't have the same success of maintaining your weight gains that you were expecting, how do we adjust the rations? And some of the other things that we can do to help improve the uh, performance of the animal. Using implants or ionophores, it's up to you. The addition of a fat or an oil. How do we get to the high feeding levels of uh, grain to finish an animal properly without having troubles with acidosis, grain overload, or bloat? And I've got a couple slides at the end for, for people that have a, a heifer project as well. Next. Yeah, next one, please. Uh, yep, yeah, just there we go. All right, so we're going to talk about the steer calves first. Away we go. So I, I put together a, a fictional animal that had a start weight of 750 pounds in October, and the predicted weight is is what you want these animals to have uh, at the uh, at the monthly intervals, so you can tell where you're at and I'm assuming a May 15th sale day. So when you've used the tape or if you use the scale, you can see that for the first three months, this animal wasn't quite performing up to where it needed to be. The first month, probably a little bit tougher to get it on feed or not getting enough grain. So his average daily gain was only about 1.3 pounds instead of 1.6, so it's 10 pounds light. That continued on for the next month and that 10 pounds turns into 15. And then in January, something happened there. They didn't gain as well as they should have again. And they're 35 pounds short compared to where they ex are expected to be by the 15th of January. Next, please. So if you look at the composition of the ration on a dry matter basis to date, this is, I'm putting fictional numbers out here, so I'm not picking on anybody, but the first month, very low amounts of grain on that starter ration. 12% um, concentrator grain and supplement, 88% grass hay. November, the grain went up to 24%, and December up to 36%, or about 8 pounds of grain a day. And that makes sense, because by the time that animal's uh, in December, it's getting close to 1,000 pounds. In order to get 2 pounds of gain on that carcass or on that animal, you need to feed roughly 
1% of body weight in grain. So getting close to that 1,000 pound range, being two pounds short on the grain that's being fed up to that point in time will result in that lower body uh, rate, rate of gain on that animal. Next, please. So putting it graphically, um, not quite as pretty as what you have in the books, but you can see that the blue line is showing you that the actual weight is starting to lag behind what the predicted value should be. So how do we change that or how do we modify, uh, um, how do we modify the feeding program to make up that 35 pound differential? Next one. So we have to make a few assumption here, assumptions here is why is that animal not gaining any weight? And the first things we have to look at is the animal healthy? Is it, is it eating well? Does the manure look ni uh, nice uh, flat pie instead of something that's watery? Are there any, you know, is it a sick animal or not? So if those things are okay, we need to say, there's one thing left to look at, and that's the feeding program. So how do we fix this? Next slide, please. So when we realize that we're not getting enough weight gain on this animal on January 15th, we have to adjust what that animal needs to gain to make it up to that 1,350 pound uh, finished weight. And the big, in the blue box there, you can see that the big problem is, is we're trying to get from 1.9 pounds a day average daily gain up to 3.22. And you can't just go ahead and throw a whole bunch more concentrate or grain to this animal and expect everything to go well. It, it's a slow process. You have to take your time and do it properly because if you go too fast, your animal will go off feed and it could take another 20 days for that animal to get back on full feed and you're even further behind than where you are right now. So next slide. Couple th easy things that you can do instead of using a grass hay that has a, a higher fiber content, lower energy and lower protein content, use something that has 30, 40% alfalfa in it. That does to, that improves the quality of the feed. It's easier for them to digest. So overall, they'll be able to eat more on a daily basis. You can increase the grain content in the ration and reduce the forage at the same time. And we'll get into that in more detail later on. Uh, I'm not uh, forcing the next point on anybody. It's up to you or it's up to the club on how they wanted to uh, decide if they are or are not going to use an implant or feed an ionophore. That's a possibility. The other thing is if you're using oats and you're finding you're not getting the gains that you want, barley has 10% more energy and 10% more protein than, than oats. Wheat and corn both have higher levels of energy than the barley by 10%. Wheat has even more protein corn does not. So that makes a complicating factor when you're trying to balance the ration out to make sure you've got enough protein. And then if you want to include some oil or fat in the ration, that can be done as well. Next slide, please. So changing from 1.9 to 3.2 pounds a day rate of gain, this is a huge change. And if you're not careful on how you do the transition, it could create a lot of big problems for you. Next. Okay, so what we're looking at is changing our concentrate ratio of, of, from 12% all the way up to 85%. Now there's an error on that 12%, that should be about six pounds or eight pounds of grain, or 12 pounds is right but uh, for that two pounds of inclusion rate. But look at the amount of change that we're looking at. Any play, we're look, we're, well, we're increasing the grain content by 10 of times the amount that's in this slide and reducing our, our hay accordingly. Now, if you're feeding silage and you're looking at the grass hay, if to convert from hay to silage, multiply the pounds of uh, hay by 2.4, 
to give you roughly the amount of silage that these animals should be eating. Next. Okay, so transition to a higher grain ration. Increase the grain in the ration by one pound every two days. Just a rule of thumb that's out there and it seems to work. Watch the consistency of the manure. If it gets loose and sloppy like in that picture, that indicates you've got acidosis problems and the rumen in that animal is not happy at all. If you see the manure starting to get a little bit loose, wait an extra day or two days until everything goes back to normal and then increase the grain. Okay. Put in the previous ones, small changes, small problems, big changes, big problems. Now, when you get over 10 pounds of grain, to reduce the chances of acidosis or that sloppy manure that you see in the picture, feed half the grain in the morning and half in the evening. If at all possible, try to space those feedings 12 hours apart. So if you're feeding at 7 o'clock in the morning before you get on the bus, then you feed at 7 o'clock at night. You need to keep it as consistent as you possibly can. If you're going to a hockey practice or a basketball practice, talk to one of your siblings. See if they can feed for you at the right point in time. And of course, there's going to be a favor to be returned someplace in the future. Next slide, please. So if you're processing the grain, if you're using barley, if you're running it through the processor or you know, through a hammer mill or a or a roller mill, you're going to be getting 12 to 15% more nutrients out of that grain compared to feeding a uh, whole barley. Oats, you're only getting 5 to 7% differential, and with wheat, you're probably looking at 25%, and corn would be very close to that level as well. And when do you know that you've got the proper consistency of a rolled product? Basically, if you've got it going through a roller mill, you can see a couple lines across the kernel and it looks like it's whole, but if you rub them between your finger and your thumb and it breaks into two pieces, that's exactly what you want to do. Uh, the processed grain should be 65 to 70% of the initial bushel weight for a proper roll. So if it's 48 pound barley, you're probably looking at someplace between 31 and 34 pounds when you reweigh it. Now, a 20 liter pail is basically one of the standard uh, units that we're using for feeding these animals. Uh, a full pail of barley, when it's rolled, will be roughly 21 pounds, and oats will be roughly 16 pounds. And if you're not sure, either sneak the bathroom scale out of the, out of the house, or if your dad's got a fishing uh, scale in his tackle box, use that and see what your grain actually weighs. It's, it does make a big difference in your overall feeding program. Next one, please. If you want to use an ionophore, it helps settle the rumen down and prevent digestive upsets or digestive problems. You need to be careful. Rumensin will kill horses and dogs. Uh, if you're using a high forage ration, and that's more for the if starter intake, uh, the uh, uh, initial rations, it'll reduce the feed intake a little bit, but in a, con a high concentrate ration, what we're trying to do, the ionophore will increase efficiency by roughly 7 to 10 percent. So in this case, you want to have your remensin levels at 33 milligrams per kg in the final ration, but you don't want to just start feeding it full bore right off the start. For a couple days, three days, feed it at one-third of the normal amount. Uh, if everything looks good, three, four days later, go to the two-thirds rate, and then three, four days later, go up to the full rate. What's happening is the rumen bacteria populations, uh, the rumensin will kill off certain strains of bacteria, making it more efficient. Now, the other product that's available is Bovatec. You need 36 milligrams per kg of uh, feed intake or roughly someplace between 250 and 350 milligrams per day. So this is something that you can use as a tool. If you have implanted your calf or are deciding to do it, uh, be careful. You don't want to have 
if you've got 100 days or 120 days left on your uh, feeding program, choose a an implant that's only 90 days long so that it does cover most of the feeding period. If you combine the ionophore and the implant together, you're probably looking at 12 to 15% improvement in efficiency overall. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Consistency. Uh, we chatted a little bit about this. Same time morning, same time at night. You don't want to change it over. If, uh, if now that Christmas is gone, uh, the temptation to give them a little bit more on a feeding as a special event, that will cause problems. So keep it constant. If you're using a complete feed or a purchased feed that comes in a tote bag, you don't want to use up the entire bag from one from the old bag before you switch to the new. When you've got about a week or 10 days worth of old feed left over, start switching then. So at that point, 75% from the old bag of feed, 25% for the new, two or three days, four days later, go half and half, and then three or four days later, go up to 75% from the new bag and 25% from the old, and continue doing that one until you use up all the old feed. And then the animals will, will change gradually, and the reason for that is the mills will get different qualities of grains at different times. So you might have had some grain that was a little bit light or a little bit more uh, screenings or unwanted uh, dockage in that product compared to something with a really heavy grain uh, will have affect the energy density and that will affect the, the uh, uh, <clears throat> performance of the animal as well. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at the previous slide and we want to go from that 910 to 1325 pounds, you can see that we're going gradually increasing the grain um, when they're on full feed. They will eat more as they get larger. So the concentrate portion of that ration will go from 20 pounds up to 26 pounds a day. So basically 13 in the morning, 13 at night, and the hay will stay relatively constant at four pounds a day. Try to keep the same type of forage in front of them at all times so that there's not a change there as well, because that can really make a difference uh, to the animal as well. Next slide, please. There is a problem with a high grain, low forage ration. Grains are high in phosphorus, low in calcium, and low in magnesium. Now you need a two part calcium to one part phosphorus ratio in the ration to keep that rumen functioning properly and having the animal digest feed and have the metabolic functions happen properly. If you don't, you might end up with some animals that have winter tetany or, or a, a, a situation where they go off their feet and they have to be treated with a veterinarian with CalMag to get them back up. So if you're looking at you doing this at home, a two to one mineral or a one to one mineral will not do the trick. Uh, you can go to a feedlot type mineral that has got roughly 20% calcium and maybe one or 2% phosphorus. But the cheapest way is just to buy a couple bags of calcium and magnesium and, and add the extra product on top of the grain every day. So the, uh, the calcium, you're looking at a third of a pound a day, 160 grams. So that would be roughly three quarters of a cup per day. And magnesium, with that, it's only a couple tablespoons. It doesn't seem like much, but it does make a difference. Now the commercially prepared stuff should be balanced for minerals, trace minerals and vitamins. So if you're feeding your own grain and feeding the calcium and magnesium, you still have to give them salt and you also have to give them the vitamins, the vitamin A, D and E to make sure that they stay healthy and keep on uh, performing the way you want them to. Next slide, please. So canola oil is an alternative to barley or wheat or corn. You can see that the energy contents in, in barley is 
oats, it's only 77. So that's even lower than barley. Wheat is 10% more, 88%. Corn is the same as wheat. But the problem with wheat is it's very rapidly digested. You do not want to split, it, split the wheat into more than two kernels. Otherwise, acidosis problems will occur. And you want to limit that grain to roughly three to six pounds. The smaller animals at three pounds, as they get close to finish, they can go up to six. But you can see that canola oil has 204% TDN, very energy dense. So for every pound of canola oil that you put into a ration, you can take two and a half pounds of barley out and still get the same performance. Now, the limitation on this is if your total fat content in the ration exceeds 7%, what happens is the rumen contents uh, slip against the rumen wall. It doesn't turn properly and you get uh, problems with bloat and also an artificial impaction. So when you're doing this, your maximum amount of oil that you can put in with the grain per day is one cup per head, which is roughly half a pound. The other advantage with using the canola oil, and for the people that are on the, the web, web webinar, it's a real nice trick. Canola oil has linoleic acid in it, one of the omega fatty acids, and what it does is it makes the hair coat very soft and very shiny, makes it a lot easier to groom and trim, and it's got a little bit more of a shine that appeals to the judge for the grooming part of the competition. Next slide, please. So keep your eyes open, watch and evaluate the animal. Is it eating? Is it eating what it should be? Does it, is it willing to come to the feed bunk or is it sort of standing back and waiting? Watch the manure. Back to the slides before. If it's sloppy and, and really loose, you've got a problem. Is the animal walking around with its head up and his ears are, are pointing forward or is the head pointing down and the ears are drooping? Does the animal walk well? Or does it sort of stifle or uh, walk along with a stiff, with stiff walk? Uh, those are all indications that there might be some problems there. If you're not sure, have someone else look at it. And of course, if something needs to be, bun to be done uh, for a foot rot or something else, provide the treatment as necessary. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, the heifer project, it's a lot different than a steer. Uh, if you have the heifer during puberty, any place from say 600 to 700 pounds until the start of the breeding season, if that heifer grows way too fast, what will happen is the udder will fill up with fat tissues and not milk secreting tissues and those animals will be poor milkers for the rest of their life. <clears throat> so. With some of the smaller breeds, you're looking at a pound and a half to a pound and three quarters a day, uh, average daily gain, that's all you want. And they want you need them to be 85% of mature body weight by the time they calve out for the first time. <coughs> for some of the larger animals, uh, the Simmentals and Charlets and the Exotics, you can probably bump that number a little bit to a pound and three quarters to two pounds a day, but I wouldn't go much more than that. Next one, please. So if you're working with a 700 pound heifer, a pound and three quarters a gain, you're limiting your grain intake to roughly five pounds of barley or six pounds of oats. For two pounds a gain, free choice hay, and seven and a half pounds of barley or eight and a quarter pounds of oats. Now the alfalfa will take care of the calcium requirement the barley should be able to take care of the phosphorus requirements. So it's a little bit easier and not quite as difficult to balance the ration uh, compared to the feedlot animal or the, the steer project. Excuse me. So the 950 pound animal, they're going to eat more. And you can see that we're not really increasing the total amount of grain in this ration the same way we did in the steers. You're keeping it about the same and the alfalfa grass hay goes up. So. I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion about, okay, what's the proper 
uh, size of the animal or what does it look like for carrying condition going into a show. But again, I'm just going to go back to that situation where if you have these animals gaining too much weight when they're young, they will not be good milkers for the rest of their life. Next one, please. So questions are, why are you having a heifer, heifer product, a uh, heifer project? Mainly, I think a lot of people like to have the ability to have that cow raise a calf and watch everything develop. And if you uh, are looking at the animal and want to keep it in the herd for many years, uh, you don't want it to be over conditioned uh, when you're putting it into the show or sale. Next one, please. So conclusions, increase the grain and re reduce the forages and the rations uh, to increase gains, but do it gradually because you can run into real problems. Consistency in time and amounts helps reduce the problems that may occur. And always, if you're not sure, ask for a second person to look at the animal. Things don't appear to be normal. Next one again, I think I'm just about done there. This looks to be the last slide. Okay, any questions from, from the participants? While we're giving them a quick second to uh, type in any questions, Barry, uh, Barry, do you have any comments about feed quality for, for this year? Maybe the presentations that you're doing around. Sure, what I'm finding is most of the forages in Alberta this year are lower in protein and lower in energy than normal. And a lot of that has to do with the weather patterns that we had with, you know, lots of moisture at start, little moisture at the end. But other people are saying that the biggest problem was after August 13th, when the smoke came in, the forages didn't develop and they didn't uh, lay down as much protein as they should have. And that's a contributing factor to, um, to why the forages aren't as good. And the other thing is when you've got forages growing in a dry or drought conditions, it tends to mature a lot faster, probably two or three weeks faster than normal. So if it was cut at the same time as what they typically did, they ended up with poor quality hay. All right. I'm not seeing any questions, but let me just do a quick little um, thing down here. And we'll see what we got. So now everybody sees a blank screen or a blank.